Ladies and gentlemen, live from the Chicago Theater, here's Kathy Griffin. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yes, I offended the Jesus people during my Emmy acceptance speech. I won an Emmy. Do you believe that? I know. All right, so I got to walk you through the whole thing because it has been heaven for me. I mean, I was in Time and Newsweek and CNN and I'm in all kinds of trouble and oh, you can't buy this publicity. So, so what happened was, you know, this year my category was once again not in the fancy primetime theater in the round Emmys. What the f*** is that? Did you guys like the theater in the round? I didn't either. I thought, no, it was a little too Cirque de Seacrest. I did. I shouldn't say that about Ryan. She's a very good hostess. So, of course, my category wasn't with the fancy Emmys with, you know, Grey's Anatomy and CSI and stuff. So my category was the week before non-televised creative arts Emmys, which I lovingly refer to as the... Shmemmies. The Shmemmies. Thank you for embracing that. <laughs> no, it is pitiful. It's me against, like, the woman who puts the chips and dip out for two and a half men. It's <laughs> pitiful. But I gotta tell you, the great thing about the Shmemmies is the biggest celebrities there are me and James Lipton from inside the actor's studio. Oh yeah, I totally know him. And believe it or not, in person, he's oddly sexual. Like he's one of these guys that gets right up in your face. It's a little to catch a predator. It is. Um, I love that show. Do you watch that show? Me too. Love it. And if there's a marathon, if I'm watching one, I'm watching all seven in a row. I like, I know their names. I'm like, oh, that's Herb. I know all the predators. I know that's really sick. And I was thinking about that, like, ooh, what does that say about me that I like watching to catch a predator? It's gross. And then I realized, because I love that moment when they catch the predator. It's so gratifying, you know? Because when they started the show, it wasn't as hot. You know, the predator would walk into that up kitchen <laughs> with the island and the two wooden swivel chairs. If I ever walked into someone's house and their kitchen even slightly resembled that, I would be like, what did I say? What did I do? I, he said he was 15. I was joking. It was role playing. What happens? What happens now? What happens? Which door? Wait, my favorite? is the decoy, right? The 18-year-old girl who looks 12, I love her with the basket of laundry. I'll be out in a second. I love her. I'll be right there. She cracks me up. And what's amazing about her is the way you catch the predator is when they walk in, and you can tell sometimes the predators are like, I don't know, this looks like a sting. I'm a little nervous. Until the decoy says, I made some iced tea. Oh my God, you guys, predators love iced tea. Don't they, they stop whatever they're doing, any rational, they're like, what, iced tea? Why didn't you say so? Uh, they, that's how they get the predators, they love it. So, so I met the Shmemmies and the show's going on and on and on. And last year I got in trouble when I lost because I thought if I was gonna lose, I wanted to have what I called my Faith Hill moment. Remember? Okay, 
Faith Hill at the Country Music Awards, they're showing the boxes of all the nominees, and there's Carrie Underwood, and Faith Hill clearly doesn't know the camera is on her, and they announce the winner is Carrie Underwood, and Faith Hill just goes, what? <laughs> and I liked her more because of that. Like, I thought that was, right? It made her human. So this year, I figured I had to top it because the tragedy of last year is that no camera was on me. So I got in trouble without the fun part, you know? So this year I thought, well, I've got to do something outrageous, but I have to make sure I do it on stage. So same category. It's my little dog and pony show, Antiques Roadshow, Penn and Teller Bull <laughs> Caesar Milan the Dog Whisperer, and then um, Extreme Home Makeover. All right, so... Sure enough, it's at the end of the show, and I'm thinking, of course, Extreme Home Makeover is going to win with their millions of dollars of budget and their Sears tie-in and stuff. So I thought it would be funny if when they announced Extreme Home Makeover, I ran up on stage as if I thought I won. <laughs> right? And then I took the Emmy, and I cried, and I thanked my second grade teacher, and I did a whole speech. <laughs> and then I would steal the Emmy and then go back to my seat. And... Um, I didn't really think beyond that, but I knew that it would be good. I didn't think it through. I, I don't know, what are they gonna do? Take it back and send me to Emmy jail? I don't know, I don't have time. And I swear to God, I actually purposely bought like chunky heel shoes so I could run up on stage faster than Ty Pennington. So I was like Flojo. Come on. Just waiting for the gun to go off. So. So sure enough, I'm getting ready at my house before the show, and I thought, well, it's unlikely, but I do have a one in five chance of winning, and I should come up with something equally offensive just in case on the outside chance that I win. So one thing I can't do to save my life is I can't write a one-liner. You know, like I tell these stories and stuff, but I can't do like a ba-dum-bum joke, right? So I called a couple friends of mine who work on Simpsons, and then I called a friend of mine who writes for that Jamie Lynn Spears show, Zoe 101, <laughs> which is a kid's show. It's on Nickelodeon or Disney or something. And he's the one who wrote the speech I got in all the trouble for. <laughs> which is genius, because he writes on a kid's show for tweens and shit. So, all right, so they sent me some ideas, and they were all very clever, but one of them just made me absolutely laugh out loud. And it's the speech I've gotten in all kinds of trouble for, and I'd like to recreate it for you now. All right, so I'm sitting there in the front row, ready to jump up and take it away from Ty Pennington. And then America Ferrara is giving away the award. So I'm ner a nervous wreck, and then I see the trophy girl bring the envelope to America. America takes it. I see her rip the ribbon off, and I'm ready for her to say the winner is Extreme Home Makeover. And then she says, and the Emmy goes to Cat, like that. And I thought, well, their show isn't called Custream Home Makeover. <laughs> Holy f balls, I think I won. I turned to Tom and he's like, go, go, you gotta go up there. So I'm running up there and I'm thinking, oh wait, what was that thing Eric wrote? Oh, it was really funny, it was about Jesus. Okay, so I got up there and I said with great conviction, you know, a lot of people get up here and they thank Jesus for winning these awards. I want you to know that no one had less to do with me winning this award than Jesus. In fact, I don't even think he likes me. If it was up to Jesus, Caesar Milan would be up here with that damn dog. But he's not, and I am. So all I can say is, suck it, Jesus. This award is my God now. So... <laughs> it's not even that bad, right? Kind of? Ah, uh, whatever. So... So sure enough, people laugh, and I thought, oh good, they got the joke. And obviously I was parodying people that thank Jesus for winning awards. Like, Jesus doesn't have more important things to do in maybe Darfur. It's more important that he's getting someone their People's Choice Award or a three-pointer from the line, but whatever. So then the next day, I go online, and I read these nice articles about how Kathy Griffin had the funniest Emmy speech, and I'm thinking, oh great, it worked. And then um, the next day, <laughs> it turned. And all of a sudden, I'm getting all these calls that the Catholic League is up in arms about my speech, and they've demanded that the E! Channel censors it, and then the Academy makes a statement about how offensive I am, so I probably f*** myself out of another Emmy. God damn it. And 
And then I'm getting calls from CNN and MSNBC and the Bill Maher show and CNN calls and they said, do you want to participate in a debate about yourself? I said, no, you just do it. And <laughs> they were very good. And, uh, and I'm getting all this trouble. And then I find out that the Catholic League is one dude with a computer. <laughs> Did you know that? And he's so famous for calling for boycotts and censorship and stuff. He's actually been a character on South Park. So that tool comes after me. And let me just say this. Yeah. And let me just say this about the Catholic League. As someone who was raised Catholic and went to St. Bernardine's, don't pull your Catholic kid bullshit with me, mother Yeah, that's right. No, no. I'm not scared of you, and I'm not having it. The Catholics, they should talk. They got bigger fish to fry than my little joke. I remember Father Porter. Yeah. Don't get all pious on me. All right, so, so sure enough, my mom is furious with me, and she's calling me. For Christ's sake, Kathleen, why did you have to tell Jesus to suck it, God damn it? <laughs> Jesus Christ, Kathleen. What the Christ are you doing this time? I can't even show myself at St. Bernadine's Guitar Mass. God damn it, son of a bitch. <laughs> Going after the poor Catholics for Christ's sake. Jesus Christ. Mary and Joseph, like I need this. Aggravation. I would rather blow a guy at the bathroom at White Castle between sliders. are my kind of audience. I am telling you that right now. It is good to be home. It is good to be home. And by the way, just out of curiosity, where are my gays at? You made it. You made it. But yes. Thank you, sir. All right, all right. Where are my women, lesbians or otherwise? Women. Where are my straight guys? That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot for me. Okay, hold on, hold on. It's a night of honesty. It's a night of honesty. Where are the straight guys who were dragged by the wife or girlfriend? Yes, I know. I'm sorry, sir. I apologize. I don't speak your language. I'm sorry. I... I speak fluent gay. I... It took two years in high school, and it just stuck. I will try to speak to your people and to your needs. Oh, man, it's great. All right, so, so the day that I'm going on Larry King, it turns out that a small Christian theater company from Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, <laughs> has taken out a full-page ad in USA Today magazine against me, an ad that cost them over $90,000. I know. Now, I've been in theater groups, okay? I was in the Oak Park Theater Group. We did the Godspell and the Joseph. Don't tell me. But we never had $90,000 to take an ad out. We were lucky if we had money for glitter for the poster. We didn't have 90 k to be throwing around to USA Today, right? So they take the ad out, and I brought it for you tonight. Just keep in mind, I couldn't get Bravo to take out a tenth of this in a million years. I could blow them all personally at 30 Rock, and never would I get this kind of coverage. So, I am in the wrong racket. Okay, so first of all, here it is, and it starts with, suck it Jesus, this award is my god now, Kathy Griffin. It says, Christian entertainers say, enough is enough, and then they print the rest of the speech. And I wish you could see the picture of the company, because there's a picture of the whole Pigeon Forge Miracle Theater Company. And they're in costumes and various, you know, some of them is, are Moses and some, but I'm thinking, <laughs> minimum 30% gay. <laughs> what? 
Wake up, people. If you are gay and living in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, what the f else are you going to do? You're going to join the musical theater. That's all you got in Pigeon Forge. There's no bear bars. This is it. Suit up. Put the wings on. All right, so then, in the ad, there's a letter to all of you. All right, it says, yes, it says, Dear America, lofty. We are the actors, singers, dancers. Come on. Crew, lesbians, come on. What? Those sets don't build themselves, honey, wake up. That's right. And then it says, over 2,000 years ago, and I thought it was going to say, when the earth was formed. <laughs> so, I'm looking at this picture of the Pigeon Forge Miracle Theater Company, and I swear that one guy is Senator Larry Craig. <laughs> How delicious is that whole thing? Right? You know why? It's because it's him. You know, I don't give a f who's gay or straight in the center. Who cares, right? Who's having an affair? Who gives a f But it's always the one that they have all this tape of saying, gay people shouldn't have civil rights. Gay people aren't the same. I would never want a gay person. But those are always the ones trying to get a job in the airport bathroom at the Minneapolis airport. Crude, but is there any place on earth less sexual than the Minneapolis airport bathroom? I would rather blow a guy at the bathroom at White Castle between sliders. Because I'm romantic. Did you guys hear the tape of the cop arresting Larry Craig? All right. I'm going to be honest. I thought they had more on him. Like, I really thought they had him, like, jerking off or something. You know what I mean? I didn't know it was all about the foot tapping. When I heard that, I'm going to be honest, I got a little paranoid. Because I thought, I wonder, I don't know, like, what if I've ever done that by mistake? Where I'm in, I don't know, where I'm in the bathroom and I, you know, drop a tampon and then I go to... <laughs> I'm hitting on some soccer mom. I don't know. Maybe I've done it. But then my gays had to school me and they said, oh no, there's a whole system in a language to the toe tapping. One tap means you're top and two means you're bottom. I don't know, it's very elaborate, very elaborate. And apparently Larry Craig's mistake was when he did something under the metal divider in between the stalls. And my gays were saying, oh, there's all kinds of hand signals that mean this or that. And I'm thinking, what the f is he doing? with the divider, was he just going out there like, hey, I want a hand job or a blow job, or maybe you could put it up my butt, or call me and I could, we could do something else too. I don't know, whatever you're available for, I will blow you too, or, and, or I could tickle your balls for a while, and that would be fun, and then maybe go back to this, and then one more of these, but call me on my cell. What? All right. So I've been running into some good people lately, and I ran into Paris Hilton. Yes, I told you tonight I bring it. All right, now look, I, this may surprise you, but believe it or not, I actually know her a little bit. Like I've met her a few times, and I did a photo shoot with her one time, and believe it or not, I sort of know her a little bit. And based on that, I'm here to tell you that she is actually um, retarded. <laughs> I know it's a very politically incorrect word. I don't care, I like it, I think it's fun. I don't mind if you call me retarded, I might call you a f card. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's a fun word. I also wanna say, I wanna be honest about this, I know, I am owning it, I know I'm going straight to hell. I know it. I have my hand basket all decorated, okay? Yes. My hand basket is idling right now. There is just a chute that could just take me down to hell at any moment. You don't have to email me anymore. I know I'm going to hell. 
And I think I might see a few of you there. Yeah. I know when I get down to hell, it's just going to be like, hi, hi, oh my God, hi! Oh, it's going to be like old home week. Me and all my best friends sitting around saying, it's not even that hot. <laughs> and I'm always getting into arguments with Barbara Walters about her, because Barbara will say, Kathy, why are you so hard on Paris Hilton? This is how I met Paris Hilton. I... Yes, I have actually known her a little bit, and I'm always getting into arguments with Barbara Walters about her, because Barbara will say, Kathy, why are you so hard on Paris Hilton? And we'll get there in a minute, don't you worry. Uh... And I said, Barbara, because she represents everything Americans are sick of. She's rich, she's entitled, she's stupid, she's famous for making a sex tape. She, you know, she shops all day. We think it's fun when she goes to jail. We like it. And, and the other thing is, I don't think she played the jail thing properly at all. You know what I mean? She really bitched and moaned about 23 days alone in a cell. How many moms here think that sounds like a vacation? Right? 23 days, no phones, no kids screaming, no doorbells. Who do I have to kill? That sounds great. So, so the night I met her, she was actually getting an award for supposedly coining the phrase, that's hot. I know, they gave her an award for that And by the way, I don't buy the fake stripper baby voice. That's hot, you guys are really hot. Because no one's born with that voice. You know, I have an annoying God-given voice, but I believe that hers is an affectation. And I just think it's funny that that's what she aspires to sound like, is a dumb stripper. Like when she was eight years old, she was like, someday I'm gonna grow up and sound like a whore. Well, <laughs> dreams really can't come true. So, so she's being given the award by William Shatner. I know, I'm laughing already. He is like my favorite red-faced, bloated booze bag. He really is. Isn't he? He's just funny. Anyway, he's giving her the award. And of course, because Paris is Paris, she couldn't be bothered to go to rehearsal. So when he announces her, she doesn't come out on stage. So he's kind of covering for her and stuff. And the audience is sort of uncomfortable. And then she finally comes out on stage. Now, you guys, when you see the walk in person, it's so over the top. Because you know, she always walks like she thinks she's on a runway. Did you see her walking out of jail? Like she was on a catwalk in Milan, out of jail. So finally she comes out on stage and she's a beautiful girl, but she's an unusual looking girl. She's very, very tall and thin and she's all limbs, kind of like a tarantula. Um, <laughs> crossed with a horse, like a horse antula. Like if a horse a tarantula or, I, you know, in a good way. So anyway, she walks out on stage, no exaggeration like this. She had just left the stable, and, and I just thought it was really funny. Okay, so she comes and she delivers her alumnus speech. Thanks, you guys. You guys are really hot. I'm hot. You're hot. <laughs> and only small dogs from miles away could hear it. It was like you would just hear a coyote in the canyon, woo, 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 answering her. But, but the best part is, after she did her acceptance speech, she couldn't figure out which way to exit the stage. I know, okay, I'm not a genius, okay, I know that, but, hmm, I entered from over there. Hmm, let me figure this one out. I'll probably leave that way. All right, so there's this moment where after the award, and the producers cut it out of the show, and I'll never know why they do this, because it's always the best shit where she couldn't find the exit, and it went on and on, and she just goes like this, thanks you guys.
It just went on and on, and the audience didn't know what to make of it. It was awesome. Okay, now, I was due to present right after that, so I was like, sweet. <laughs> you gotta realize, that moment for me, that is a gift from baby Jesus. <laughs> with a big red bow on top. So, I go out on stage, and of course I have to make fun of her getting lost and do that stuff. <laughs> totally killed. Um, yeah, it was super funny. Until I remembered, I then had to run into her 90 seconds later in the hallway, which I always forget when I'm making fun of these people, that I then have to see them. So, I go backstage, and Paris is giving me the evil eye, you know, and I just wanna say this, the more I meet these super famous people, the more I find they're exactly the way you would think. Which I love because they do all these interviews saying, you know, I'm nothing like that. The press paints a picture of me. And my personal favorite, I was edited to look that way. Now, you can't pull that with me. I have a reality show. And if anything on my show, they edit me to look, you know, nicer. So, yeah, you can't pull that Omarosa bull with me. So, I go backstage, and there's Paris, like every photo you have ever seen of her on that pink sparkle phone. There she is, pink sparkle phone. And I'm thinking, even Paris Hilton can't be talking to someone that much. Is that possible? You know half the time is just, the time is 10 p.m. <laughs> and 40 minutes, beep. All right, I ran into another good one. And this is someone that I have lovingly <laughs> been talking about in my act. I finally met Paula Abdul. I, I lived and died for that Hey Paula show. Did you watch it? That was event television. I am telling you, I loved it. She is my favorite little junkie, and here's why. Allegedly. Look, I don't know what she's on. I'm not a pharmacist. Uh, I never said I was. Look, don't act like I'm making this up, okay? How about when she just passes out at the judge's table on Idol, right? You've seen it. You have a terrific energy and you should... <laughs> right? You've seen it. Have you noticed how this year Paula has trouble uh, keeping both of her eyes open at the same time? <laughs> right? The right one kind of wants to go down for sleepy time. And the left one's like, wake up, you're on TV, but I'm tired. No, no, not yet, but you promise. It's not nine o'clock yet. It's like the ancient struggle between good and evil on her own face. <laughs> and you can actually see the progression of the drugs between eight and nine o'clock. Like eight to 8.15, she's pretty good. She's lucid, she's in the moment. She's giving good criticisms, right? 8.15 to 8.30, she kind of starts to go down, you know? 8.30 to 8.45, she's white knuckling it. White knuckling it, it's almost nine. 8.45 to nine, it's full on up cerebral palsy, Paula. Hey, that's a really good thing that you did. Touchdown! Touchdown! Simon! And he's not there, Simon! Simon! But the thing I loved about Hey Paula is, we knew from American Idol, we're not naive, we knew that she was a little loopy. <laughs> Until Hey Paula, we had no idea. Holy <laughs> balls, you guys. The stuff she said on that show, you can't write it. You can't make it up. I work my ass off, Jeff. <laughs> I work my ass off, Jeff. Where's Jeff? Like, it is... I walk around my house all day saying it. I'm driving Tom and Jess and Tiff crazy because I get on the intercom, I work my ass off, Jeff. Everywhere I go, I work my ass off, Jeff. Where's Jeff? I... The sh she says on that show. They're trying to beat me up. But they can't because I'm warrior. I don't even think it's drugs anymore. I think she's getting asphyxiated from that hairspray. I do. And my personal favorite, 
I'm tired of people not treating me like the gift that I am. Who talks like that? Who? Who talks like that? Let me tell you something. I think she should be legally required to have her name changed to the gift. Yes, yes. Her driver's license and passport should say Abdul Kama the gift. Or Gifty McGifterson or Gifty McGee. Something with the word gift in it because that is what she is to me. So I see her at a party and I'm there with my girlfriend Jennifer Coolidge. You know Jennifer? She's so funny. She's so brilliant. She's in all the Christopher Guest movies. Oh, for the straight guys, she's Stifler's mom from American Pie. Wake up. All right. So Jennifer sees Paul Abdul and she goes, look. There's Paula Abdul. And, and I see Paula Abdul, and I actually overhear Paula saying to her friend, clearly about me, ugh, I just don't want to deal with her right now. And, you know, I totally have it coming. I mean, I cannot blame this poor woman. But I said to her, oh, come on, just say hi to me. And she was really sweet. She put her arms around me, and she goes, okay, I admit, you make fun of me very well. And she was nice. We had a nice conversation. And the best part is, as she walked away, she goes like this, oh, and by the way, I love what you say about Ryan. <laughs> oh yeah, because you know, I was there in the eye of the storm. I co-hosted the week before with Rosie, and then I co-hosted the day after the big fight. Oh yeah, day after, right there. Oh, I have to tell you, about the behind the scenes dirt of when I did the Larry King 50th anniversary toast. It's some good shit. Okay, now I don't know why Larry King likes me, but he does and I'm just grateful and he lets me say whatever the fuck I want because I think he thinks I'm Kathy Lee Gifford, but <laughs> I'm not gonna push it. Okay, so. So they call me up and they say, would you like to participate in the Larry King 50th anniversary roast? And I said, a roast like on Comedy Central? And then they go, we'd like you to think of it as a toast. <laughs> I get it, I'd like to be on the show again, so that'll work out fine. I said, well, who else is doing it? And they said, well, Bill Maher is hosting. Now, I love Bill, I think Real Time is a great show. And um, I've known him for a very long time, but he's a total prick. Like, he's one of my few straight guy friends who just treats me like shit, but he makes me laugh so I can't ever get mad at him. Do you have any friends like that that just bust your balls and you're just laughing? You're like, damn it, I meant to get mad at him. So, so he's one of those. All right, so wait till I tell you the other toasters. All right, so Bill's hosting. Me, Dr. Phil. That tool, I know, can you believe it? Dr. Phil, who by the way, isn't even a real shrink. Like he's, he's, he's like a botanist or some shit. Like he's not even a real doctor, right? And he's another one with this distorted vision of himself. How about I'm Dr. Phil when he talks about how hot he is? Well, don't mind me, I'm just a jock. On what bald guy, fat ass team are you on? <laughs> Phil. And also, he's supposed to be helping people on that show. I don't like when he gets all caught up in his southern good old boy colloquialisms, right? Somebody has a problem and he's like, well, if you walk into a barn with a hasty and you got a match and there's a bottle of kerosene, what the f are you talking about? <laughs> Phil, help someone. So he's there. And also Dr. Phil is super, super right wing, super, super George W. lover, right? So he's there and we actually had to do a sound check. And this was funny because they decided to make the show a surprise to Larry King. And the genius of that is, you can't surprise Larry King. He doesn't give a shit. He's interviewing a president tomorrow. He's interviewed everybody. You can throw confetti and jump out of a cake all day. You cannot surprise Larry King. He's just like, I gotta go, I have a goiter. Like there's nothing, <laughs> nothing you can do, right? So they actually separated us from Larry to have a sound check. So I'm at sound check and then right away, Phil's gotta start in, right? And he goes, well, believe it or not, I actually find you to be quite funny. So I go, like, I give a shit, you tool. <laughs> All right, guess who is another roaster? This is some A-list Jane Fonda. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And I know people hate her because of the Hanoi Jane. Get the over it. Let me tell you something. 70 years old, she has had a wall of shit 
fall on her and she survived. She deserves respect. I dig her. All right, so, yeah, boo. Oh, yeah, she's a big traitor. Whatever. So, so anyway, she looks great, by the way. She's got the body of a 15-year-old girl. You could bounce a dime off her ass. Now, the funny thing about her being there with Dr. Phil is that Dr. Phil is very far to the right, and Jane Fonda is uh, not. <laughs> so I have to tell you something that happened during the commercial break that's going to blow your mind. OK. During the commercial break, it was kind of uncomfortable, and people weren't really talking, and I didn't know all the people and stuff like that. So I look over, and I see Phil hitting on Jane Fonda hardcore. Yeah, like being really grab-assy with Jane Fonda. And at the same time, he's saying sleazy like, well, you know, my wife, Robin, would actually be quite jealous. She's such a fan of yours, like that. And I swear to God, I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, take your hands off Jane Fonda, you douchebag. Who do you think you are? She's Jane Fonda, you're you. And then, and I'm thinking, okay, should I say something? And I'm trying to calm down. I'm thinking, you know what, Kathy? Learn from the master. Jane Fonda has been dealing with this stuff for decades. She's going to know how to deal with this better than you could ever imagine. Not everybody has to suck it every minute. All right, so I'm watching Jane Fonda, and I'm watching her closely, and the way she handled him was absolutely masterful. He'd be grabbing her, and she'd kind of giggle like a schoolgirl, and then the minute he let up, she would say like, I hear George Bush is drinking again. He's a very serious alcoholic. <laughs> Shut his mouth. It was genius. So then Larry says to Bill Maher about me, she's very funny. You should have her on your show. But of course, Bill has to be a prick. And he goes, oh yeah, if I want to know what's going on with the world, I'm really going to ask Kathy Griffin. I know. And I go, F you, Bill. I went to Iraq last year. When are you going to go? And he's like, oh, I've been meaning to go. So... <laughs> But yeah, I love those people that have seen it all and done it all and met everybody, which brings me to a little show called The View. <laughs> oh yeah, because you know, I was there in the eye of the storm. I co-hosted the week before with Rosie, and then I co-hosted the day after the big fight. Oh yeah, day after, right there. All right, now, I know a lot of people don't like her and they think she's very divisive, et cetera. I gotta be honest, I love Rosie O'Donnell. I think she's a pistol, and I think she's smart, and I think she got a lot of women talking about stuff that they wouldn't normally talk about, so there's my two cents. But I didn't know about the fight because when it happened, I was actually on a plane from LA to New York to go do the show. So I hadn't turned on the TV, I opened my email, and there's an email from Rosie that says, I'm not going into work tomorrow, sorry, kid. So I write her back and I go, do you have a cold? And I know. I, and she writes back, I'm not going back ever. So I turn on the TV, and then I see the fight is on every channel, entertainment shows, news, everywhere, right? You saw that fight, right? Yeah, I know. And I watched it, and I was like, holy <laughs> it was another Like, I couldn't even <laughs> believe it with the split screen and all that stuff. All right, so then the next day, I go in to co-host, and there's news crews there and everything, and then Barbara says, now, Kathy, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about this for the first 90 seconds, and then we're not going to refer to it again. And in my head, I'm like, that. So, yeah, right. I brought it up every three minutes like a goddamn egg timer. How could you not? How could you not? So the next day, my mother calls me. What the hell happened? I go, Ma, what? She goes, last night I'm watching my boyfriend, Bill O'Reilly. I go, Ma, you have to stop watching that show. And he's saying real terrible things about you. I go, Ma, I don't care. Well, then I'm watching Sean Hannity right after that. Ma, stop watching that show. What the hell did you say on The View, for Christ's sake? Jesus Christ. Why do you got to agitate Barbara all the time? Why, Kathleen? So, so my mom's upset with me again, and then... And then the guest the next day was going to be Martha Stewart. So then my mother says, for Christ's sake, Kathleen, don't agitate my Martha. Because, oh yeah, my mom is crazy and she thinks she knows these people. My Martha has had such a difficult year. Just don't agitate her. I said, mom, I'm not going to do anything. Kathleen. All right, so the next day Martha Stewart shows up. All right, what? It's good. Okay, once again exactly 
the way you would think she would be. Exactly. First of all, you know she's got that accent. She's got a very pointed way of talking. And she's from a foreign country called Connecticut. And <laughs> she's got a way of talking that lets you know that she has more money than you could even dream of in your wildest dreams. So, so she just talks funny. All right, so she brings in three of her assistants who she makes wear uniforms. Yeah, I know, exactly. A salmon shirt, khakis, and a kerchief. I love it. Let me tell you something. Monday. Monday. Tom, Tiffany, and Jessica, uniforms. That's right. Something to show some respect for the company. Maybe a thong, a tutu, and pasties. Monday. They can suck it up. They can do it. They care. So... So of course I wanted to meet Martha Stewart, right? I mean, who doesn't want a picture with her and stuff? So Barbara does this very nice thing where she usually comes in my room a few minutes before the show starts. But I still can't resist just giving her because it's so much fun. So she comes in and I said, um, so Barbara, you and Martha, that's gonna be kind of Clash of the Titans, am I right? What, what are you talking about? Come on, Barbara, cut the You two are gonna be like cats in a box. What? My mouth is one of my very best friends. So, fan in the fires. Fan in the fires. So, so then, so then I go, hey, help me get a picture with Martha. And Barbara goes, I really wish you wouldn't. I go, come on, I want a picture with Martha Stewart. Kathy, it's highly inappropriate. So then, <laughs> so then I go across, I knock on Martha's door across the hall. Martha opens it and I go, Barbara Walters wants a picture with you. And I push her in. So, Wouldn't you? So I go in and I'm trying to like introduce myself, like, excuse me, Miss Stewart, I should just want a pic. And the two of them are having this conversation in a total fame bubble. Why, Barbara, it's so wonderful to see you in autumn color. Martha, whatever you tell me to wear, you know I will. You've got to come to Connecticut. I've got a wonderful muffin recipe. You've got to come to the Hamptons. You're welcome anytime. And the whole time I'm like trying to get in there. Tom has got the camera and he's so nervous, the camera's shaking like this. And finally, after a while, I gave up and just stuck my head in the middle. <laughs> So one day we're all sitting there, and it's Joy, myself, Barbara, and Hasselbeck. And then they start talking about their favorite topic, menopause. All right, I want to tell you my favorite makeup room of the view story. Because let me tell you, that's where it's all going down. There should be a show just called The Makeup Room at the View. All right. Oh yeah, because those girls talk about anything and everything. It's all on the table. So one day we're all sitting there, and it's Joy, myself, Barbara, and Hasselbeck. And then they start talking about their favorite topic, menopause. Going on and on, and then they're saying that when I hit menopause, my um, vagina is going to dry up. <laughs> I know, I said, how dry are we talking? Like tumbleweeds, or <laughs> like an old western town? with a sheriff and a general store and a <laughs> gunfight at the OK Corral or the Alamo? Like, how dry are we talking? So then I decided that this was yet another golden opportunity to try to shock Barbara Walters, my favorite thing. And I said, well, you know, Barbara, I'm not afraid of a little KY jelly. <laughs> oh, yes, because I am going to shock Barbara Walters, to which she replies, Willie, I prefer Astro Glide. No.